Assalamu alaikum welcome in debate I am your host Tariq Khan today we will explore and analyze the global security outlook and way forward uh, it is my honor and great pleasure to uh, introduce professor dr Julian Richard you are director at center for security and intelligence studies uh, university of uh, buckingham uh, england united kingdom uh, professor dr Julian thank you so much for joining and you are welcome in program Sir, will geopolitical tensions continue to escalate in coming years or how do you uh, see this uh, uh, in global security context? Okay, <clears throat> well first of all, thank you very much Tariq for inviting me onto your series of discussions. It's a, um, it's a great honour for me to <clears throat> uh, give my thoughts on, on these issues to your, um, to your audience. Um, so, the, how your question about geopolitical tensions. Well, I think if there's one thing we can be absolutely sure of, it is that a, a number of regional and global tensions will sadly continue uh, over the next year. Um, and I think there's probably, at, at the global level, the, the big story that's been rolling away for a few years, really, will continue to be a big factor. And that's the question of how the um, the major powers are going to approach each other, um, both globally and regionally. And of course, probably the, the, the biggest question within that is the question of how um, China and the US will, will see each other, how they'll interact with each other. Um, in some ways, the US position is, is slightly less clear at the moment because um, US is obviously going through a change of administration at the top. We don't yet know exactly how the, the new Biden administration will be towards the likes of China uh, and indeed Russia. Um, and we could perhaps characterize it as a, an ongoing uh, struggle between uh, democratic systems and more authoritarian systems. And, and the big question for political theorists, as, as we know, is will um, the likes of China be able to rise um, in the global economy, in the global geopolitical space, um, in a way that avoids major conflict with, with other actors and particularly with um, the US and its allies. So that will continue to be a big question. And it colours all sorts of uh, regional alignments, regional um, security strategies and policies, and we'll perhaps say a bit more about that as we go along. Um, and then thinking about the regional sphere, we, we, um, we have issues in the Asia Pacific region, um, issues such as maritime tension in the South China Sea, particularly between China and the, the range of countries um, in that particular region, tensions over um, e exclusive access rights to um, resources and to maritime zones there. That will continue to simmer away and it will be interesting to see how, how that develops. Um, we have the North Korea situation that, um, that hasn't gone away by any means and we've seen in recent weeks that the North Korean regime is, is, is returning to its um, position that it occupies uh, sporadically of, of being a belligerent power on the world stage of, of threatening all sorts of um, uh, dire consequences to the US and others. Um, so it'd be interesting to see again, it'd be interesting to see how the new US administration approaches that particular issue in particular. Um, we have uh, in the Middle East, there's a, there's a whole range of, of really long running tensions that haven't really resolved themselves at all. So uh, the, the civil war in Yemen uh, is still grinding on without uh, much uh, resolution, it has to be said. Um, and of course, in the, the Middle East, the, the key factor again is the contestation of power between um, key uh, key mini superpowers in that region. So um, Saudi Arabia and its Gulf allies on the one hand versus Iran. Um, Iran will be a very interesting one to watch. Um, how, will the, how will Iran take forward its strategy in the coming year? Uh, they've suffered some some setbacks, such as the um, assassination of uh, Soleimani and and uh, 
other incidents that have been disadvantageous to Iran. Its, it's economy is, is having all sorts of problems as well. So that'll be an interesting one to watch. Um, the global extremist and, and terrorist movements are still very much there. Um, the Islamic State and its offshoots um, and other um, violent extremist groups that are still, um, the, the ground is very fertile for those groups in a number of different regions around the world. So I think that will, um, that'll be playing out certainly over the next year. And of course, um, in the Pakistan uh, region, the, the situation in Afghanistan is, is absolutely critical. And as we know, there are peace talks going on there, but or about Afghanistan, um, but they're not necessarily reaching a, a clear resolution at the moment. So that, that situation will continue to rumble away um, and will continue to have implications for not just regional security, but, but for global security as well. So plenty of things to watch, plenty of points of, of conflict and contestation, um, and it, it's, it's going to be another interesting year, I think. Sir, how would you explain the tensions and doubts concerning the U.S. role in the world, especially the uh, Joe, under Joe Biden presidency? Yeah, well, this is interesting because the obviously there's lots of speculation at the moment about whether and how things will change. Uh, we know that over the years the the U.S. has tended to fluctuate between being relatively isolationist and wanting to draw back from involvement on the global stage and relatively in, relatively interventionist and wanting to get involved in in security situations around the world um the the trump era of course like so many things about president trump the the overarching strategy wasn't necessarily clear and there there were perhaps some conflicting things going on um he he was generally keen as far as we can determine to to draw back to a certain extent to have fewer US troops engaged in um, long running uh, situations overseas um, but at the same time some of his other actions were quite forward leaning and quite interventionist. I think that what the strategists seem to be saying with Biden is that um, it's, it's likely to be a, a return to the Obama uh, sort of strategy that preceded it and of course Biden was um, was a key figure in the Obama um, government for many years. Um, and by that, we mean that there's a return in the rhetoric to this um, idealism, is this importance of being the, the vanguard of, of freedom and democracy, of um, aggressive, not aggressively, but, but um, robustly confronting situations where democracy seems to be imperiled around the world, um, the issue of human rights compliance, um, something that the US, um, as, we've, as we saw in the Obama era and um, rhetoric from the likes of Hillary Clinton, that some of these things continue without there being intervention. So some strategists are saying that we could see a return to a more interventionist approach from the US where it, it will be more prepared to get involved in um, conflict situations around the world in order to achieve its aims. Um, others have taken a slightly more nuanced approach and saying while it, 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 it might talk a lot more about um, human rights and democracy over the next few years, um, it, it's generally likely to take a more negotiating table based um, approach to things. So it, it, it doesn't, although they may be talking a lot more about these strategic interests, that, that may not translate into actual um, military actions around the world. So everybody is speculating. Of course, the immediate concern of the Biden administration is more do domestic than international. Um, so we don't know. But we, um, I think if we look to how the Obama era was, we'll probably get a lot of clues um, as to how the Biden era is likely to be. Sir, does uh, European Union play any role in reshaping and reforming the global security framework? Yes, well, this is, this is an interesting question. Uh, at, at one level, it remains the case that the 
the EU has never been a particularly strong military or security power um, beyond its its borders. It's it's tended to be much more of a an economic force than than anything else. Um, it's because of the nature of the EU. There's never been consensus on um, a coordinated military and security strategy, other than. Um, issues to do with internal security, um, more policing type issues, if you like, counterterrorism and so on. Um, there's never been agreement on having unified military forces across the EU. Um, a lot of EU countries are members of NATO, of course, and will participate in, in NATO's military actions. Um, but the EU itself has never had any um, realistic um, military capability other, other than for peacekeeping it's fair to say that the EU contributes a lot of peacekeeping forces around the world and that's an important part of what they do however with all of that said the departure of the UK from the EU there are some signs that this is leading to a um, change of strategy within the EU and, and particularly something that that France very much favours which is to press ahead with and, and deepen military coordination and, and strategy across the remaining EU states. The UK was, was always particularly not keen on, on deepening military coordination across the EU. So with the removal of the UK, that perhaps offers some opportunities for it to press ahead the, um, the military security strategy of the EU and their various proposals there. I think... I think generally, I, I don't think these will be tremendously successful. I think the EU will continue to be a primarily um, economic and to some extent a diplomatic player. We, we should note that the EU was one of the signatories to the Iranian nuclear deal, for example, and played a very important role in, in that particular deal. But generally, it's, it's not as influential or as active as other actors, such as the US, for example. So, and I can't see that changing too much in the short term because um, the EU is, by definition, a um, made up of, of of 27 different states who all have slightly different views about how 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 far and how deep they want to go with with pan EU strategy, particularly on big things like military cooperation. So, I think they'll continue to have um, difficulties on on that side of things. Um, so we probably won't see an enormous change, I don't think, on, on, on that particular question. Uh, sir, how would you explain the security outlook in Asian as well as African region? OK, well, to, to a certain extent, I think the first thing to say is that particularly in Asia, um, not so much in Africa, one of the big complexities of, of regional security is is the uh, the question of whether and how each individual state aligns itself to either China or the US. So a lot of um, Asian security strategy and policy is, is coloured and, and shaped to an extent by the nature of the China-US um, relationship with each other and the question of whether and how states align themselves to one or the other side. To a certain extent, uh, a lot of Asian countries don't want to have, don't want this to have to um, uh, completely dominate their security strategy. They want to be able to develop um, both local security strategies and also um, to rather like the EU to try and develop the security dimensions of, of regional groups like ASEAN, for example. Um, but inevitably, the question of whether you're on China's side or the US's side or both is is a factor and will continue to be over the next few years. Um, so that's um, that, That's going to probably be the, the most important factor. Obviously, depending on where you are in Asia, if you're um, in the border of the South China Sea, for example, so Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, countries like that, um, you know, the, the, the big security question is this question of um, contestation of maritime uh, resources and territory with China and how that plays out. Um, in other places, in South Asia, for example, things like um, Kashmir, Afghanistan, um, relations with, with Iran um, 
as opposed to other uh, Middle Eastern states will, will be a complex calculation that will have to be undertaken. Pakistan, of course, and we'll come back to Pakistan a bit later, but they, um, Pakistan has to think about where it sits in the middle of all of that. Um, in Africa, I think the, um, the same issue applies to a certain extent, but the, probably the, the bigger factor in Africa is the question of um, democracy and whether and how democracy can be consolidated across the continent. We've, we saw that in, in the 1990s and into the early 2000s, there was there were promising signs. There was an increase in the number of um, nominal democracies across African states. There was a decline in the number of authoritarian states and um, military coups and violent takeovers declined. To a certain extent in recent years, we're, we're perhaps seeing that, that the tide turning a little bit there. We're seeing a number of countries, um, Uganda at the moment, for example, um, Ivory Coast, numerous other African countries, um, leaders who were, were nominally elected democratically, consolidating their rule, extending their, their tenure in office and becoming a more authoritarian than they originally said they would be. So I think the big, the big question for Africa is, will it be able to um, halt a slide into dangerous and violent authoritarianism or will it be able to make good on the progress it seemed to be making towards um, more open and democratic uh, regimes and economies? So I think that will be the big, the big factor across Africa, you know, to differing degrees in different countries, of course. Sir, do violent extremism, uh, terrorism and instability will continue uh, to hang over the already conflicted regions? And how is the world order changing? The what we sometimes problematically call the Islamist movement. So the um, the ideologies that led to Al Qaeda and and to other groups such as um, ISIS and and the broader Islamic State. Um, that jihadist ideology, for want of a better term, violent jihadist ideology, is still with us to a certain extent. It's it's um, experienced some setbacks in the recent in the recent years. Obviously, ISIS itself in Syria um, suffered a very considerable setback and, and contraction. Um, but uh, the view of most experts is that we shouldn't see that as the end of the story by any means, and that um, many of the extremists within and around those organisations will be thinking about how they can. Um, return to the fight and, and continue with the mission, the, the caliphatist mission, if you like. Um, so that will play out to a certain extent in, in regional dimensions. Uh, we know that in um, Afghanistan, for example, the Islamic State Khorasan province idea is, is there. It's, it's not making tremendous headway at the moment, it has to be said, but um, it's something that um, certain uh, individuals connected with that movement will want to continue to try to develop in that region to, to um, develop some sort of presence and foothold. In other parts of the world, notably Africa and particularly the, the Sahelian belt, if you like, um, so countries like uh, Mali, Niger, um, Mauritania, countries um, like that, there's there's, um, or, and even in other parts of Africa, such as Mozambique, for example, we're seeing very serious Islamist movements emerging, in some cases linking up with each other and turning out to be really intractable, intractable problems for many parts of Africa. And it's difficult to see any of that going away anytime soon. I think that will be an ongoing um, struggle for, for those countries. Um, Separately, the um, and and just to finish off on that point, I think um, that particularly with the more global groups like ISIS, for example, or groups with global outlooks, um, the sponsorship of terrorist attacks in in other parts of the world, such as Europe or North America, will continue to be there. We we 
the, the number of those attacks has declined in the last few years, but they, we still get those sorts of attacks. And I think we would still will continue to have those sorts of attacks because the ideology is still there. Um, I think in other parts of the world, particularly in the Western world, actually, the um, other extremisms, which in some ways are mirror images of the Islamist movement. Um, so particularly things like um, extreme right-wing movements, anti-immigrant movements, and a whole host of other weird and wonderful, um, often very internet-based social movements. Um, a lot of them coalescing around conspiracy theory um, ideologies, which we've seen a lot of in the US and, and to a certain degree were, were very influential and important in the recent events in Washington, D.C., I think those movements will continue to to grow, to forge connections across communities and, and to cause some problems in, in local areas. Um, and there's an important link there with technology and particularly with the Internet, that the Internet enables a lot of those those movements to to develop on a, on a grassroots basis across regions. Um, and I think that will continue to be a to be a factor around the world. Um, so, so yeah, these um, some of these things may seem, depending on where you are in the world, of course, may seem at a at a lower level at the moment. But the the nature of the ideologies involved in many of these extremist movements mean that um, the battle still goes on, and and they will still they they will reemerge in various ways in the coming year. Sir, how would you uh, explain Pakistan's role in regional as well as global security dynamics? How do you see Pakistan's role? Yes, well, um, Pakistan has a very complex and interesting role, actually, in um, both regionally and globally. So um, where Pakistan is on the map means that it is inevitably a key player in um, regional and global security dynamics. Um, the fact that it um, sits on the on the edge of Afghanistan, that a number of um, violent movements, um, such as the Taliban and and Haqqani Network and other um, other sectarian movements, uh, have have been present in and around Pakistan means that it has a very important role to play, not only in ensuring its own domestic security within Pakistan, but in um, ensuring that some of these mo movements with broader international aspirations don't, don't flourish to the degree that um, none of us want. So now we have seen, as we know, we've, it appears to be the case that we've seen some successful developments in Pakistan on, on many of these fronts. Um, we've seen a more comprehensive counterterrorism strategy in recent years. And the figures seem to suggest um, that there is a clear reduction in the, the number and lethality of, of attacks that we've seen within Pakistan. Um, but again, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that the job is done and the, the story is over. There, there will continue to be very considerable challenges for Pakistan in keeping a, a grip on those things. And I think the... The international community will look to Pakistan a lot to, to play an important role on this. We know that um, the Financial Action Task Force, for example, is a very important and complex issue for Pakistan and will continue to be one. That many in the international community um, feel slightly unhappy that Pakistan is perhaps not playing the, the role that it should be playing in um controlling and, and interdicting and restricting some of the, the bigger um, extremist and terrorist movements, whether that's Lashkari Taiba or um, Jaishi Mohammed or, 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 or other groups, the Haqqani Network and so on. Um, and we know that for Pakistan, this is a very complex issue between balancing regional strategic interests with complying with the demands of the international community on these things. So I, I believe Pakistan was um, given a stay of execution to a certain extent in October of last year where um, the Financial Action Task Force didn't, um, didn't blacklist Pakistan, but it has kept it on the grey list. So there's, there's still work to be done there. 
Um, I think regionally, the, 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 the ongoing, perennially ongoing tensions with India and, and particularly over Kashmir um, will continue to be important. Um, personally, I think both countries continue to need to to show leadership on that issue and to try and find a way forward that doesn't continually fall back into perpetual conflict and animosity. Of course, that's easy to say when, when looking in from the outside. Um, but that that's one of the big problems, both regionally and globally, that really needs to, to move forward at some stage. But if we look at Kashmir today, we can see that there's you know, two major problems there. Um, the... Pakistan's role in the Afghanistan situation is, is absolutely critical. We know that it has been playing an important role in, in sponsoring and facilitating um, peace talks with the Taliban. Um, whether those will achieve um, the goals that we hope they will achieve remains to be seen. We know that there's a lot of unhappiness that while these talks are going on, there are still murderous attacks happening in Afghanistan, many of which are almost certainly being conducted by elements of the Taliban. So that's making the peace process very difficult. But everyone uh, internationally accepts that Pakistan has to be at the centre of that situation and has to play an important leadership role. So that will continue to be important. Um, and then finally, the um, as we were saying earlier, the the... Um, the question of regional and global alignments, um, how does Pakistan balance its relationship with China, whether that's on, on economic factors, um, economic co collaboration and so on, um, or, or military factors, the supply of military um, aircraft and so on. How does it balance that relationship with a relationship with the US um, and uh, one that Pakistan would like to be a favourable relationship ultimately with the US. That's a very complex situation for Pakistan to deal with. And other, um, other alliances are complicated as well, um, and particularly the Iran versus the, the Gulf states role. So within the Muslim world community, Pakistan has a, has a complicated role. On the one hand, it's, it's probably more naturally aligned towards the Arab Gulf states. It receives a lot of um, economic assistance and funding from the Arab Gulf states. Um, but that in turn means that those states expect Pakistan to be aligned to them when it comes to um, military and strategic objectives. And that in turn complicates the relationship with Iran. And, and you know, we have to remember that Pakistan actually borders Iran and, we, and particularly in and around the Baluchistan province. There are a number of um, difficult security issues that will require some degree of, of collaboration between Pakistan and Iran. So that will be a very difficult and complex game for Pakistan to play. And it will, it will require very strong and enlightened leadership in Pakistan to um, make sure that all of those things can be managed in a way that ensures not only Pakistan's security, but the, the security of, of other regional and global actors that rely on Pakistan's uh, collaboration. I think that there is no doubt, you know, India, of course, has a, um, a strategic um, confrontation with Pakistan on a number of fronts, um, particularly over Kashmir, obviously, um, but over a number of other issues as well. And um, th that will, that will, that will always colour relations between the two countries. It will probably, it probably does almost certainly mean that that both countries are interfering in the um, stability of each other to to a certain extent. Whether that's in um, assisting particular groups or movements, or in on the international stage as you describe on the discussions over the financial task force and so on. However, I think there's there's a couple of things. So one is. Um, as I said earlier, the one of the the, the hardest but um, most encouraging things that could happen in regional and international diplomacy would be for India and Pakistan to find a more constructive and less confrontational approach to each other um, that could really break this cycle of, of continual 
accusation um, um, of continual confrontation. Um, because apart from anything else, from an economic point of view, it it um, doesn't make any sense either to India or Pakistan um, for um, the two countries to be very closed off from each other, so the two countries um, not to have good relations with each other. I think there are absolutely enormous economic benefits that could flow if if India and Pakistan could might could find a better accommodation with each other. Um, India or Pakistan. I think there's a big challenge for the leaders in both countries to um, find more constructive ways forward that, that break this cycle um, that's been going on for, for decades, really, of um, accusation and counter-accusation and, and confrontation. Um, I don't know how you do that, but I think there's, there's space there for enlightened leaders to, to find ways of doing that on both sides. There should be a lot more going on, and that would be hugely beneficial to both economies. So I know that's a really that, that's kind of my view as an outsider, if you like. And, and a lot of these things seem logical if you're not if you're not invested in one side or the other. But those that would seem to me to be the, the holy grail <laughs> for um, both Indian and Pakistani politics to try and find a solution to in the coming years. Sir, thank you so much for your valuable and precious analysis and thank you so much for joining again. It's my pleasure and, and thank you.